example, but maybe a little bit. Um, so I'm interested, like, before I get started, to kind of understand the audience a little bit. How many of you guys are shipping things into mobile devices right now, Android or Apple? Okay. How many into Apple specifically? All right. And you guys, have, how many of you have already shipped a blockchain application to Apple? Sweet. All right. This is perfect. So this is primarily like a focused conversation on kind of goes high level in terms of like the process of shipping. But really, what we can dig deeper into is like what's the pain in the butt about trying to ship blockchain applications to Apple, and how you can get over those hurdles and uh, get your applications out there. So who am I? Uh, I'm John. I'm the CEO at Vault.io. We make a wallet. If you downloaded it, thanks. If you haven't downloaded it, you should pull it down. Uh, if you search the App Store for Vault Wallet, it should be the first result. If it's not, let me know. Uh, you'll get a free collectible. It's kind of cool. You can play around with it. You'll probably get a crypto striker. So if you're into soccer, you'd be particularly happy. Um, and let's, my background is uh, I was at Facebook before this, uh, where I was building enterprise applications as well as working on the groups team and shipping a bunch of different mobile applications. I've dealt with the Apple Review Committee from a couple of different perspectives as an individual, as an entrepreneur, and as a representative of a large multinational not very evil, but awesome corporation. <laughs> um, and, uh, and before that, uh, I worked at Microsoft for a little while, so a lot of kind of reference in terms of working with these guys. Um, the application we have out there, if you've already used it, is Vault. It's kind of this beautiful attempt at helping people understand what D apps are out there, how do they discover them, how do they interact with them. Uh, we tried to use a lot of sort of Apple-specific frameworks in building this thing, uh, and created a really nice wallet interface as well that lets you have things like an identity on the blockchain, um, your balance is obviously shown, and then kind of a focus on things like collectibles to help people understand the types of things they can own, the contacts, the receipts that are out there, uh, as well as sort of a nice view of all the different types of collectibles and a light box view to come in here and show them off to friends. So they hold up my cat and be like, check out my cat, it's super cool. And then we're building in now a lot of native capabilities inside the application directly, where you can do things like share. So if I wanted to send that cat over to Cole, it's a couple of clicks as opposed to having to go into like OpenSea and like click down three or four times to do a transfer. We use Secure Enclave, all the things you expect to use in a mobile device. Um, and we've had a good bit of luck here, kind of interacting with Apple, where we've seen a lot of uh, a lot of individuals and a lot of companies have trouble. So I think like getting this through for us was a huge accomplishment. I'm sort of psyched here to kind of talk through that process. So cool, why mobile? A lot of blockchain is not mobile right now. If you look at the wallets that are out there and the ones that are popular for interacting with dApps, they're mostly developer tool-centric wallets. They're things like MetaMask, right, which is fantastic from a development standpoint. It reminds me a lot of like Firebug in the early days. It's like a nice, easy to use tool to get in there and build out your applications and interact with them. Um, but mobile has to be the future, right? This is where most consumer adoption of applications is. It's the thing that's in everyone's pocket, which means that it's your link to the physical world. When you walk into a coffee shop and you're going to be <coughs> with blockchain or with crypto one day, you're going to be using a mobile app, right? We're already converting consumers to understand the idea that a phone can be a wallet. We've got Apple Wallet out there with Apple Pay, we've got Google Wallet getting bigger squares, doing a lot of really interesting things. Not really sure what we're going to do with crypto long term, but some interesting things with crypto. Um, and then long term, the phone starts to become identity. So one of the cool things about blockchain, I think, is the identity attribute, where you've got this history of who you are, it's tied to everything you do, is that public address. You can have infinite wallets, so you can have infinite identities, and a lot of interesting control. And the phone translates that really nicely. So this has to be the future, right? This is the direction everything's going. If you go to uh, Facebook engineers or any other like major consumer app and you ask them where all their users are coming from, they're not really even thinking about web anymore. So I think the faster we get there as blockchain developers, the faster we're going to get to a world where people who are not developers start to use our applications. OK, cool. So building for the iOS app store. Apple's not the enemy. This is like really important. I talked to a lot of people building for Apple, and they're like, oh, this is going to be terrible. I'm just going to ship to Android instead. But if you actually like back off and you get a little objective, you realize that Apple's actually supporting blockchain in ways that a lot of companies are not. Google won't let you advertise at all. If you want to go and talk about a crypto blog, you can't even run Google AdWords into Google right now. It's completely blocked Apple. As long as your app is approved, you can be in search ads. You can go and compete with the other apps that are out there. You can pay enough money that you show up at the top of every search for wallet. It's pretty cool. Um, Apple's doing a lot of like guideline uh, implementation where they're trying to make it so that it's consumer friendly what you can ship, but they're also trying to widen and to support things like ICOs. So I don't know who in here has like BRD wallet, pretty popular wallet. Yeah, right, used really heavily for ICOs, right, which you wouldn't think most mobile providers would, provide, would allow. Apple lets you do it as long as you have the relevant uh, regulatory capabilities. 
So the biggest thing to remember when you're starting to build uh, for Apple is Apple protects users first. Apple thinks about the world from a user standpoint. They don't think about it quite so much from a developer standpoint. It's the chagrin of a lot of the developer community. But when you're building, you have to think a lot about the flows, about the interactions, about the expectations of the user. Whenever people ask us about the uh, process of getting past the guidelines, we tend to say, think less about the guideline, think more about the philosophy. It's a very philosophical company. Right? It's this approach of we don't want to misguide users. We don't want people to come into applications and do things that they didn't think they were going to do. And cryptos had so many scams. If you look back from like November all the way through February especially, right? the, num the percentage of crypto-related things that had advertising money behind them that were scams is huge. It's like 90 plus percent. So Apple is really thinking about it from that standpoint. And if they even get a whiff of the idea that you're out there trying to get people confused that you're watching taking money from them, like, it's over right away. The third thing to know coming into this is Apple loves Apple. It's like Kanye loves Kanye, right? Like Apple loves Apple. Like when you're shipping into the App Store, one of the things the review board takes into account really heavily is anything you do that showcases the capability of the device. So usage of the secure enclave, like usage of it in a way that's really friendly, right? Like uh, here you've got, and if you open the App Store today, like AR Spotlight, right? Anything using AR is going to be right there in the front because it shows off the capability. When Metal came out, like any games that were Metal enabled, like right there on the front, and you'll get that promotion. This is not a meritocracy, this is editorial board, right? Think about it like you're shipping to a newspaper and trying to get on the front page. They are making editorial decisions about who sees your app, what's allowed to be in here, and how is it listed. So huge no-nos. Do not mine on the device. Don't even like, try to mine on the device. Like, oh, but you pulled right away. There's actually a little bit of a fine line there. You can sort of do light mining if you're like running your own chains and the mining doesn't use the processor very heavily. They're mostly watching out for battery life. Right? There's a huge Apple war right now between Apple and Android in terms of battery life. I think Samsung has that ad out right now for the, the one that's trying to use her iPhone at the airport and it like dies the minute she tries to scan it and then she gives them the Samsung and the world's great. Like there's a lot of focus on that and that's actually like where the mining concern is. Um, like acting like an exchange when you're not. Uh, so so this, this has hit a couple of companies like CryptoKitties and these other ones where they're like sort of an exchange. People aren't really sure if they're an exchange. They're like promoting the cats as speculative value. It's like a huge risk there because you're talking less about the intrinsic value of the <coughs> asset and you're talking more about getting rich. So Apple hates this idea of like coming here and get rich. They want the idea of long lasting value of the application. Um, I see without legal compliance is sort of the bread wallet. Uh, mentioning blockchain if you don't have to. This one's a little bit strange, like as we go forward, <laughs> like the, the, the applications that are going to be really popular are probably the ones that are infrastructure driven by blockchain, more than they're going to be the ones that are dancing blockchain out in front of you the entire time. So we've noticed Apple's like big fans of this and more applications that are starting to come out, less included, who talk a little bit less about blockchain and more about what you're going to get, like collectibles, dApps are okay to talk about. You have a little bit of a better chance getting past that review board on the first try. Also, uh, paying users in cryptocurrency to do things. It sounds like a huge asterisk, right? Because do you guys have Kinet? Like the Kin uh, application? <coughs> it literally is an application that pays you to use it. Like every, every function inside that pays you out. So it turns out this guideline is a lot more about don't pay people to promote your app. So you can't reward with cryptocurrency to have someone do a tweet, for example. Absolutely, you can't do that. Oh, by the way, these are big no-nos because these can get you basically blacklisted. Like you can do something wrong enough that you're just never going to make it through. Like that's kind of the editorial board side of this. So cool, so design, right? Apple cares more about the design and the usability than they do about your crypto contracts. Like your crypto contracts aren't going to get tested by Apple, they're going to be scrutinized by the community, but your design is going to be heavily tested by Apple. Apple's done a pretty good job of publishing like the general design principles, and if you take these to heart, they'll kind of make it through. They, uh, they break down into three, you've got clarity, which is like, is everything clear? Is the text legible at all the different sizes? Um, are you able to like, fill your negative spaces properly? Are you using consistent colors, palettes? Apple's an industrial design company, top down. It's all about design. They'll look really closely at that. And you'll get a lot of really difficult responses from them if you haven't given thought to design. But what I mean by that is you'll get sort of a response where they'll cite a guideline. Like, who here's been rejected by Apple? Yeah, they always cite a guideline, right? Like, no matter what, they'll cite a guideline. But the reality is there's something else that's usually wrong. They'll be like, oh, it's 5.5.3. and they will be this sort of, like, generic human interface guideline. But the reality is they think it's like... <laughs> 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 uh, difference, like fluidity of motion, like beautiful interfaces that help people understand. We kind of call this craft. 
this is like, don't go wild with your like eye candy Photoshop filters when you're trying to go and build things out. Don't stick bezels all over the place. They like those flat design. Um, in a lot of ways, Apple's sort of chasing Microsoft right now and what the early Windows phone was, which is sort of funny, right? It's like veteran design is coming back to Apple now a couple of years later. Like simplicity in design. If you're developers and you don't have a designer, but stick to your grades. Like dark brown, like black, white, like stick to a single color palette where you can't screw up and accidentally stick like yellow next to green where it doesn't belong. Um, and then finally, depth. And depth is very real inside of Apple applications, right? You've got a lot of layering. Everything sort of feels physical, but it's been layered on top or on bottom. If you don't use depth effectively, it's confusing to the user. And Apple's just really, really sensitive about that. If you hit developer.apple.com, there's like 100 pages of this stuff. But really, if you follow these three, like these are the things they'll just have to bounce back at you and kind of complain about. All the resolutions. I don't think most people realize most Apple testing happens on iPads. It doesn't matter if you're giving them an iPhone. They're going to open that thing up on an iPad mini, and they're going to test it at scale resolution, and it's going to look awful. Like, this happens every time. You go in there, you spend all this time getting your process perfect, right? It's like HTML code. You're like cheating with all these breakpoints and stuff to get it to look right. And then you send it to Apple, and they open it up on this horrible resolution uh, device that has no chance, that doubles it for no good reason. And then you've got, like, you can't even describe how bad it ends up looking. You can't get a screenshot. But you'll have, like, the profile photo up here, and the text overlays it. And all of a sudden, you have a screenshot of this. And you either have to go out and buy an iPad mini, uh, or you've got to go and like re-evaluate the way you're using sort of their reactive design. Uh, I recommend pretty heavily against storyboards, to be honest. Like programmatic design tends to handle this stuff better than storyboards do, but that's kind of a, a decision on, on how you want to build your apps. So cool. So if you survive the design phase and you're in build and test, um, there's a couple of real basic things you need to make sure you do for people as you're building, like extra clarity around cost, spend, and transaction times. No one understands how the heck Ethereum works. Ethereum is a settlement network, right? It's a fast settlement network, but like you go and buy something, and it takes forever. It can take one minute, it can take 12 hours. And being really clear about that inside of the app, because Apple will try and go in there and buy something, and they'll freak out if they see pop-ups come up that don't really make sense about the explanation of what they're attempting to buy. Um, don't eat de over decentralized. You don't have to decentralize everything. It's pretty okay to store your user list in a MySQL database. Like, not a big deal. Like, that'll make those parts of your app work really quickly, even if the payments need to go into the blockchain itself. Um, I'm really excited about some of the stuff that like Loom and these guys are doing to kind of get level two up there so that we can do more responsive design inside of iOS. We've seen a lot of iOS applications that just get rejected because they're pokey, right? You'll like go and click the buy button and nothing happens. And it's not really the app's fault, but it's the app's responsibility to explain that to the user. Number three is super important. Um, expect worse than terrible connectivity. If you live in New York, get on the subway and use your application like from one end of the line to the other end of the line. Apple will take the device and turn it into airplane mode, and they have these little boxes they seem to put the device in that like cuts off connectivity, and they'll test to make sure the app is reflecting back to you that it's disconnected and giving you some sort of actionable capability because of that. Um, this one big thing we missed when we were building it, but it's like super important to go and like, throw out transactions, just feed back to the user and let them know what's going on. Um, and then uh, libraries you can use. So we have an open source library called EtherKit you can check out. Uh, which is pretty cool. It's a bridge between Swift and uh, Ethereum. It works it gives you kind of a free HD wallet. Uh, has all the translations built into it. You will fit number overflows and normal things like that. Uh, it's pretty young, but we'd love it if you check it out if you're a developer. Uh, it's over here at vault.io slash etherkit. Got a link at the end here. And then you hit test flight. So test flight's gotten a lot better. Like a year ago, it wasn't that great. It's pretty good now. Test flight now, you can just distribute a public link to, to 10,000 people and they can use your app. And if you can find like 10,000 daily active users inside of an Ethereum app, like you don't even have to worry about it, right? You can go raise your Series A before you even launch this thing. So I think like test flight's getting a lot better. It's getting a lot cleaner. Uh, we didn't use it as much as we should have. And like looking back and now the way that you can do the app distribution, it's like a nice way to launch without going through full review. So the way test flight review works is you've got a 24 hour turnaround. Almost seems like it's exactly 24 hours. There's a lot of automated tests going on. And they're really just checking to make sure the app doesn't do anything like overload the processor uh, or violate any like, automated tests in terms of the way you bring your code. Apple can detect programmatically created code. I don't know if you guys remember when Apple started rejecting all the auto uh, created code from the companies that were going from web to Apple automatically. Like they'll reject all that stuff outright, and the automated tests will tend to pick that up. So you actually have to write it in Swift. You can't always use a, a translator. So cool, so get approved, right? Turn around, as little as eight hours, as many as eight days, sometimes eight months. Um, it's a complete black box. We've found a couple of tricks that we found seem to help. It seems to help if you've gone to test flight first. So even if no one uses it, like submit it to test flight at the same time as submitting it for an app review. 
can't prove it, it's anecdotal, it seems to have a pretty positive effect on it. Um, ship super early, so as soon as the app is at MVP point, Apple, like all of their advice says wait until the app is completely done and ready to go to the public. Like with blockchain, I kind of disagree with that. You're much better off shipping right away, like as soon as you have something that's starting to work, because they're probably going to give you a couple of rejections. And that'll give you like that early feedback from them on what's going to work and what's not going to work. And they don't really penalize do doing this. They don't penalize the idea that you would ship the app a little bit too early to them. They'll only penalize you if you try to ship them like 50 apps at once. So sometimes people will go out there and they'll create like 30 versions of their app and they'll try and ship all of them to figure out which one Apple approves. Like that'll actually get you like lowered in the review queue and it'll take forever. Um, another one that I don't have up here is like don't try to send them anything close to an Apple event. Like everything just breaks down like probably three days before an Apple event all the way to like one week after an Apple event. If you look at this spike, like this was the most recent Apple event that happened and the average review times bumped up to I think it was like a week for a little while there. Um, they have a process for expediting a review. It doesn't really seem to do anything uh, in our experience. And then the third thing you can do, which is a super hack, is you can actually go into uh, the ship process and where you pick release date, you can pick like from three. There's one that is manual release, there's automated release, um, and then there's, there's a third one, which is timed release. And if you pick manual release, and then you go into the country selection area and you turn off all the countries, that after Apple reviews it, you can actually release the app, which then makes all of your further app reviews be update reviews instead of brand new reviews. And it helps you like iterate through your further reviews later, even though the app is technically shipped. So you basically ship to nothing. You kind of flew through that, but like that's one of the best things you can do in blockchain to kind of get into the update cycle as opposed to the initial ship cycle. Because the initial ship is all about like a deep review by Apple. The update cycles are just like what's the diff. In fact, if you ship an update and it's just like very small stuff, their systems can tell, and you'll get a review in like an hour. They won't even open the UI. Most rejections, bugs, incomplete or substandard UI, misleading content, or low user value. That last one really bugs people. Like, they actually will reject if they don't think the app you created is something that will be valuable for a long time for users. Like, you'll get a rejection back, and they'll just say, no, this is, this is cool, but it's only cool for a week. So like make sure whatever you're creating and however you're shipping it, you like stretch out the timeline to have some reasonable reason for users to come back. I think dApps do this a lot of the time, but like ICOs violate this pretty often. So ship it early. So finally launch it. Um, the one downside of shipping to null, shipping to no countries, and then iterating past that is you're gonna miss out on this first thing, which is when an app is initially reviewed by Apple, you actually get a temporary boost. You get like one week where searches for things that are similar to your app like get artificially boosted in search results. So you have this kind of like short period where Apple tries to help your app be successful. Um, there doesn't seem to be any way to push that forward, like version updates, nothing else seems to bump it up. It's only that initial release. Uh, we've heard Apple actually has a developer advocate for blockchain, but it's a one-way relationship. You can like email them, but they won't write you back. <laughs> um, so it's apparently worthwhile to like email to the generic uh, app address and just tell them what you're up to and then just kind of like leave it alone. And apparently like that helps get a couple of checkboxes through the process. Uh, search ads are pretty cool. Um, they're, 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 they're sort of, uh, they're not nearly as powerful from a control standpoint as like a Facebook or a Google, but they're reasonable in that they'll rank blockchain applications equally against other applications despite the spend. Um, so they're expensive, you'll spend a lot of money, but early on if you have a generic name like Vault, they can help you push your application up on that list uh, for people searching directly for you. Uh, and then finally, make sure the info is scalable. Um, Apple will pull apps that become rapidly buggy after launch. So if you pull an Instagram, this isn't a bad thing, but if you pull an Instagram and you launch 25,000 people and your, your info keeps falling over, like if you can't stand it up effectively, like you'll eventually just get delisted from the store. It seems like Apple delists a little bit more aggressively inside the blockchain space. We've seen like two or three apps even just recently that have like gone out and have disappeared within a week or so. Um, and it's really bad if you get delisted because you have bounced all the way back to the initial review state, which means when they go through your application the next time, they're going to start all the way at the beginning again and go through all the flows as opposed to a, a, you know, an update from review, which is just what's changed. So that's it. I fit that in 30 minutes. How do we do? You have to be kind of creative. You can, you can do the signing from it, but generating 
the key is difficult inside. Um, I'm, I'm not, I don't run the edge side of what we did. I did Cole on our team wrote all the cool wallet code. But if you go check out Etherkit on GitHub, it's got all the code that we used to do that signing. And it's similar to the function that like Trust Wallet uses or Coinbase Wallet. Everyone's sort of taking the same attitude. Uh, you can use the crypto, the arcs available inside of the secure enclave to programmatically generate the arc that's necessary to programmatically generate the Ethereum uh, private key. And then it does live successfully in the enclave after that and can be used for signing. Okay. Do you theoretically have a private key to set an enclave and never leave that phone? Yep. In fact, that's, that's what every wallet should have. Um, and Apple seems reasonably sensitive. I'm not sure if they just kind of figured out wallets in general. But uh, they'll even allow you to uh, require the enclave. So uh, if, you, if you load it up and you want to say, no, you can't use this at all unless it's in the enclave, that's an okay thing to do if you're a financially oriented uh, company, which is kind of cool. Like, we expected that to be more of an issue, and they didn't seem to mind. Are you with React Native at all? I'm using Swift, full Swift? Full Swift, yeah. Um, no, we actually don't use React Native as much. There's, there's, we've run into a couple of performance issues with React Native and Native across the devices. Um, but I, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I think it's just whatever development. The ether kit is the thing you build internally that, what would be, is there like Web3 equivalent for Swift? Um, so ether kit connects it down to Web3. So it's an injection, right? It sits, sits the wallet sits on top of the web that pops up, then it injects the web 3 js and then the wallet interacts with it. And EtherKit communicates through Swift to make all of that native instead of having to figure it out individually. Yeah, there aren't too many packages for that. We created it primarily because we couldn't find a good one at the time. Trust Wallet has some nice open source around it, um, but I, since the finance acquisition, I haven't seen quite as many updates from them, so I'm not sure if they're still maintaining that. So is all open source as well? The wallet connectivity is, the front end UI is not. Okay. So we, we tried to open source all the blockchain related pieces, but it's it's kind of a mess to open source the entire UI when you're in early stage because you end up like shipping tons of stuff to GitHub that aren't really necessary for the <laughs> open source. Like we'd love it if people grabbed the wallet and forked it and like used it to create competitors, like that's what the industry needs right now. But we're not super excited about like grabbing the entire UI structure and copy pasting it. Uh, so you had a, a note about um, the apps are not like the apps that reward people in crypto. Yeah. Would this include things like earn.com? Uh, so again, I think it's primarily about uh, things that reward you for promotion. Like they don't like, uh, you know, tweet this app and get a dollar. Uh, they don't like, uh, you know, post on Facebook and get a dollar. But they don't seem to mind, you know, work that people want to do where they're then rewarded in money or crypto. Uh, Kin is the example I tend to use, which is still live out there and had you know, a very large number of downloads early days. So I think if Apple was going to shut that kind of thing down, they would have done it then. Um, it's technically against the guidelines, so you're walking a, walking a bit of a tightrope if you do it. But it's generally, a, you know, what, what have they approved in the past? You mentioned, Brad, when you were talking about how having done a non-compliant ICO could be a problem. Yeah. So how did Brad navigate that? So I can't speak for Brett directly. So Brett doesn't run the ICOs, but they let people buy into ICOs. And sort of more of they have a platform attribute to it. And you'll go to like the web page for the ICO and click through and the address comes back. So it's really just acting like a basic wallet. They just are allowed to talk about ICOs because of the way wallets are made to it. So I think they're they're a little bit more uh, regulated than others would be. But I don't, I, they're not actually running the ICO. You know, Brett didn't run an ICO inside of Brett. And Brett uses a third party for like credit card to uh, crypto transactions. They're not actually doing the work. They do, uh, I think they use some funds yeah, to, to, to actually do the transactions. Android. Hmm? Android support? Android support? Yeah. For Vault? Not yet. Yeah. Uh, we're starting on iOS. Uh, we've got a lot of iteration to do. I think the wallet space is something that isn't totally understood in terms of what does the world need. Sure. So like the yeah. platform experience versus native experience, and it's it's just a resource problem. Can you get enough people together building both platforms versus like starting up one and growing? Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. could have anything um, specific for him. It does not. Yeah. But it would be awesome if someone wanted to go try and figure out how to port it over. Um, um, that would be really really cool. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I guess the phone model is like a little bit different for like a secure one. I think the big, the big advantage in, in iOS is the models are pretty controlled, right? You can target really effectively, and there isn't that much separation or diversity by model usage. Whereas I think in the Android space, there's so many low end Android phones, which is really the goal, right? Like if you're building a WhatsApp or something, you want to work everywhere. Crypto is tough because you need security if you're storing the wallet on the phone. So you really don't, you're like, what this line? Do you want to let people who have devices that can't actually secure 
the private key you to use it. I mean, in some ways, from a growth standpoint, you do, but from like a security and adoption standpoint, you don't. And we don't really know what loses trust in this industry. So in, I, in iOS, it's a little easier to target right now, but uh, I, I wouldn't say that it's an either or. I think it's, it's what your engineering capabilities are, which is the one that's most available for. Have you guys explored Mobius yet? No. What is it, Mobius? Uh, I, I actually, I'll, I'll talk to you after. Yeah, let's turn up. I don't care more about it. Yeah. <laughs> I have a few questions. <coughs> you mentioned that uh, you know, there's a whole list of no-nos you, you shared. It was very insightful. I mean, what if you have the app that you log in with certain user ID and, and that's not available to Apple, and then you allow some features that's after the fact, uh, would they come back and do this too? You know, knowing that there's something behind that it's part of the, not necessarily a no-no, but it's close enough to a no-no. I think, I think you just roll back the philosophy again. Like, if, if you're not trying to hide these things, they're not going to be a problem. Like, it's okay to iteratively ship. And technically, like, Web3, it's all, it's all the web, right? Like, it's unrestricted web content. So Apple won't come in and restrict your ability to access web content. Like, Reddit's my favorite example, right? You can't ship porn to the App Store, right? But, but Reddit has lots of porn. And it's okay, because it's user-generated content. It's technically web-generated content coming in. So I think like when you're building in uh, in the iOS space uh, for blockchain, you sort of think the same way. It's like okay, maybe I'm about to like link down to something that isn't allowed by the guidelines. But you know, questions come up: Is it user generated, or is it company generated? Is it native to the application, or is it a web link? You sort of walk through this tree in your mind, and as long as you sort of come out the other end saying, all right, this isn't like a native thing shipped into the application with Apple's stamp of approval, you're probably okay. But again, it's it's less about the guideline and it's more about the philosophy of are you misleading users, uh, are you confusing users, are you doing something that you know, maybe legally you're not supposed to be doing. And generally, if the answer to all of those things are no, and the UI is doing a good job of explaining that to the user, then you're probably okay. I can't I can't speak directly to a larger one of because of Apple, but that's been our experience so far. Um, second question: uh, Does it doesn't matter what framework you use? So, uh, you already mentioned that you're using Swift. Uh, we use Xamarin because we can direct both uh, platforms at the same time. So when it comes to approval, it doesn't matter how you generate your app. I think it matters more from an update standpoint, actually, because when it's auto-generated code, every time you change things, like far more of the code tends to mutate before it goes out to Apple than like if you were to just go in there and make the updates and the pure swift code. Um, and because of that, it'll flag as like a higher priority uh, review. I'm sorry, not a higher priority, like a, a more extensive review based on how much code has changed. I don't, I don't, I don't know. I haven't shipped a lot of like sort of framework generating code uh, in the blockchain space, but that's been my experience in general. Has been the more auto gen code there is, like the higher risk you'll have on the more extensive review. Um, it doesn't mean they'll reject it, but you can imagine like a diff experience, kind of like a GitHub experience on Apple's side, right? They've got your raw code, and it comes back and tells them, I think, it's like how many lines of code have changed, like what's the impact of these lines? Does it affect the UI? And what we've noticed is if you don't touch the UI, they don't test the UI. It's pretty cool. They'll just go in and make sure like your code looks OK and they'll, they'll progress forward. So you can kind of avoid that problem of going all the way from user registration forward with them if you're not changing it. But a framework might go through and touch a lot of lines, and then they might go through those tests again. I think we're out of time. I hope this is useful. Um, I'll post yeah. these, uh, these slides online. Um, feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. Like, I'm, I'm happy to talk really candidly about the process. Uh, and if you're having any trouble with that, we're happy to give you whatever advice we can. Cool.